Good morning, Interweb. Welcome back to another episode of the Lurst World Lang Review Showcase thing, where I review and showcase the worlds and conlangs that you have submitted. First up, we have Marcus Cups, who submits their triple star system. The central star Minux is a white star. Aldrak, a red giant, moves around Minux's equator with its northern pole facing Minux, sort of like a wheel hub. Finally, Justal, a yellow star very similar to Sol, rotates around Aldrak's equator its northern pole also pointing towards Aldrak. Around Justal, we find Kilgamere, my world. So Marcus, you have set up your triple star system really well. You have one distant star, and then you have another binary pair. Ace work, love it. The placement of your world, Kilgamere, is a little bit unbelievable. Given a triple star setup like this, there's two places we could place a planet. Either you could put it around Minux, or you could have it orbit both Aldrak and Justal. But orbiting just Justal alone, that's a bit weird and quite an unstable scenario. So I would consider perhaps reworking this. Overall though, great work. Next up, we have Evan Robbins who submits the phonology to Dare Conlang Tlan Ngai. This chap here is a Vedar approximant. I can't do Vedar approximants, so apologies. Anyways, this is the phonology of my Conlang Tlan Ngai. The syllable structure is CCVCC. Some things to note in this inventory is a three-way allophony of the alveolar, velar, and uvular nasal based on its clusters. The diphthongs are odd, but not so much so, and add a lot to the orthography. Vowel length is marked with a circumflex. So yeah, the three-way allophony there in your nasals is definitely a little bit strange. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I kind of want the standard spread of nasals, ma, na, na, but your justification seems to work for me. If I understand this correctly, in isolation, you'll have something like ma and na forming minimal pairs, but anytime a non-bilabial nasal clusters, it'll take on the place of articulation of the other component in the cluster. So you'd get something like amp, ant, ank, and so on, with none of these forming minimal pairs. That kind of makes sense to me. Let me know if a nat lang does this because I've never really come across this before. It's an interesting idea. Next up, we have Andrea Sara who submits their Mun Empire Astronomy. In my world, oh, there are two moons in the sky, the white little Hivit and the red and bigger Rod. Their cycles are based on the current calendar system in the Mun Empire a 360 day year with six months of 60 days each divided into 10 day weeks. Months start with two full moons and weeks start every half cycle of Hivit. Days are named Dagun, Dagu, Dagte, Daku, Midag, Dagsi, Dagset, Dago, Dagno, Endag. Calendar building can definitely be a bit of a nightmare trying to make all the various different bodies fit together. That's why I often advocate to have moons if you're gonna have multiple moons orbit in an orbital resonance. Something like one is to two, two is to three, etc. And that's exactly what you've done here. Hivit orbits exactly three times for every two orbits of Rod. This is a very stable situation and also it makes for an extremely easy calendar, so well played. Glad to see orbital resonances in action. You mentioned that one of your moons is white, so fairly moon-like, but the other one is red. That's interesting. I wonder how you're justifying that. Is it magic or is it something more mundane like high iron content rocks or something like that? Overall, great work. Next up, we have Puyo Puyo who submits the phonology for their conlang Sakatsia. I've made a conlang inspired by Oa. It's called Sakatsia. I've changed the phonology so many times that I think this is the one I'm most comfortable with. Sakatsi is supposed to be a Slavic lang. What I like about the phonology is that it's almost symmetric. What I dislike about the phonology is that I think there's too many sounds for my minimalistic mind. The whole idea of me being here is to make like little tutorials so that people can take them and create their own worlds and languages and it's always so fun watching it come back at me, watching me see the results of that. So thank you so much for creating this phonology and this conlang. It really means a lot. A couple of things I consider changing. I consider adding in a voiceless velar plosive, ka. I find it a little bit strange that that's missing. And also given that you're going for a Slavic lang, I would consider dropping the bilabial trill. Blah. Kind of doesn't fit the vibe you're going for, I don't think. In terms of just how many sounds there are, it isn't the most complex phonology out there, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you want to reduce, I consider looking at some of the vowel inventories from Slavic languages. They tend to be quite stripped back. Something like five or six-ish monothongs, excluding length variations, etc. I know that's not all Slavic languages, but some of them are very stripped back. Consider looking at those and then maybe working from there. Overall, great work. And thank you again for remixing some of the stuff I do here. That's dope. Next up, we have Suleiman Salim, who submits a post-apocalyptic setting of the Greater Silly Isles. FYI, the term Greater Silly Isles is something that comes up in the lore of my podcast. It's our little silly term for all of these islands. 
So being Irish, I'm going to focus on Ireland, and Suleiman has created the following. From north to south on the island of Ireland, there are the autonomous region of Ulster, the reborn kingdom of Ireland, the Socialist People's Republic of Dublin, the coalition of the Free Irish, the vassalship of the Lords of Dingle, Limerick, and Cork. So this was submitted as kind of like a, a fun little joke, but I spent way too much time thinking about how this scenario might come to be. I don't know what caused this apocalypse in Suleiman's setting, and that likely has ramifications for how the geopolitics plays out. I wonder if the general gist here is that there's been a civil war between the reborn Kingdom of Ireland and the People's Socialist Republic of Dublin. They seem like they may have views that are diametrically opposed. I wonder, did this conflict destabilize the region enough that like an additional plantation occurred, giving us the autonomous region of Ulster? And I wonder, is that uninhabited land in the middle? I'm thinking that's either the site of the apocalypse, or some sort of big explosion, or maybe it's a sort of demilitarized zone separating the two kind of powers. I don't know. This is all just guessing because you haven't submitted any lore and I realize no one outside of the Greater Scilly Isles cares about this whatsoever, but I really care. So if you want to submit me that lore, I would be more than happy. Please do. Also, people in comments, speculate away as to what you think the geopolitics of this region is. Next up, we have DJ Hopkinson who submits their Ingoran Abugida. The Angora Nabogida is written on a baseline and characters either go above or below. The consonants are designed with the analogy of a tree in mind, where the characters that dip below the line are akin to the roots of a tree, and they are the phonemes that sound the biggest and lowest, so the nasals. The next characters in each level are like the tree's trunk, the branches, and the leaves, and the phonemes get higher in pitch. The tree analogy is important because the people who speak Angora live in a very tropical, rainforest-filled region, and plant life is a key part of their life. I like the framework of this, the sort of teaching aid that is the tree analogy, and I like how you're thinking about organizing the sounds. My feedback could be, think about organizing the sounds less in terms of a sort of nebulous, like higher pitch, or bigger, lower pitch, and think of organizing them via the sonority hierarchy. So perhaps most sonorous sounds go on the bottom, the tree's roots, and least sonorous sounds go on the top. I don't know, like the linguistics nerd in me would kind of prefer that. You also left a recording, so let's have a listen to that. Oh, those trills. Oh my god, I wish I could do trills like that. They sound so good. Next up, we have Sam Katz who submits a postcard from the capital. I submit to you a postcard from the capital. It's meant to be a map of the capital city of my homebrew D&D setting that you can write a letter on the back of and fold up into an envelope. The Empire is a massive China-like country with Steam Age-ish technology in which the government is all wizards who have to pass exams in civics to qualify. The quasi-mythological Bronze Emperor of old built the enormous transfluvial canal connecting the two major river valleys of the Empire and placed the imperial capital right in the middle. So can we all take a second and just admire the attention to detail in this artifact from Sam's world? Like the cartography is just on point, clear, well-labeled, intriguing. There's even a stamp from the map making company, which is there to give us a compass rose and also to give us a small inkling into how years are counted on this world. The addresses on the back tell us more about this world. One is clearly a rural address and the other is clearly a more urban address. There's even a postage stamp, which is just great. And of course, the piece of prose will naturally tell us a lot about this world. This is really good diegetic world building. For those who don't know, diegetic means like of the world. So where the story and the characters and like the plot of a world are told through artifacts from the world. This is really good. For a simple postcard, you tell us so much about your setting and just, it's great. You mentioned some of the things you don't like about this. The empire doesn't have a name. To be like China, I tried to give everything transparent names. The provinces ended up with cool names like Five River Province or Red Mountain Province. But the empire and capital city feel like cop-outs. I can't think of a good name for the empire that's catchy and invokes an East Asian vibe that doesn't seem racist or stereotyped. Any tips on more interesting place naming? I will make a video on this at some stage, but for now, links in all the usual places to a really good video on quick and dirty place naming. In general though, people shouldn't be too afraid to use cop-out style naming. Like real boring prosaic names are totally fine. Like Beijing, for example, as far as I'm aware, that means Northern capital or something like that. 
Nanjing means something like Southern Capital. There's a town not so far away from I live whose name translates as Lake Head because guess what? It's a town at the head of a lake. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the empire and capital city. In fact, capital city even reminds me of Republic City from The Legend of Korra. So it kind of sparks an East Asian vibe as is. Also, capital city in particular gives a real industrial feel. Like this is a thing that's been created. This didn't arise naturally, which is the case in your setting. So again, I like capital city. That said, if you really don't wanna go with the empire and capital city, consider just Khan Langing that'll hide all the prosaic workman stuff away from us. Or maybe come up with some sort of name for capital city that invokes the quasi-mythological emperor that built it. The Bronze Emperor? The Great Bronze City. Bronze City. Bronze Waters. Something like that. Regardless, stellar work. I dig this postcard. Something serious. And that was that. Another episode of Woolhurst done. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted. Without you, this would not be a series. If you, dear viewer, would like to be in with a chance of having your work featured on a future episode of Willerst, check the description. Submission criteria are there. Thanks for watching, thanks for submitting, and until next time, Edgar out.